tell you that you're probably using them all wrong. So what I'm going to show you throughout this presentation is that the way we wear our sunglasses is potentially harming our health and that we should wear them the opposite way of what most people tell you. Now, Center for Disease Control states that sleeplessness is a public health concern. And in fact, over a third of Americans, that's like 100 million of us, have trouble falling asleep at night. And some huge proportion, above 50 million people, take prescription medication to help them sleep. That doesn't go into all the people taking over-the-counter supplements. And I was one of those people like where I kind of had insomnia for many, many, many years, and I was trying to solve it. The, the way that I got into all this research is trying to solve my own insomnia problem. And so I did a deep dive into the research, the literature. I tried supplements. I tried meditating. I tried so many things. And to go backwards, so at the time, I was working in pharmaceuticals, so all the drugs that you all know and I'm sure have used, both over-the-counter and prescription, I was creating, and I did that for 10 years. And at one point, I found myself sitting at the top of this 10,000-gallon batch of drugs. And that, that's like as big as a huge swimming pool. And I was making a children's pharmaceutical product. And I'm wearing a respirator, and I'm wearing a bunny suit, and I'm wearing gloves, and there's skull and crossbones on the outside of the containers that we're pouring in, and it says carcinogen all over them. So we're protecting ourselves, and I'm pouring this in, and I'm just sitting there telling myself, like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So I ended up leaving that industry. I got a uh, master's in holistic nutrition, studied all sorts of diets, went into a career in sustainability and the environment, and did that for about 10 years, and now I do something completely different, same company though, uh, where I kind of keep toxic chemicals out of furniture products globally for our company, that's kind of my role. And so I'm doing like the opposite of what I thought I was doing before, which is putting toxic chemicals, unfortunately, into children's pharmaceuticals, as well as high fructose <coughs> corn syrup up to the laxation point. Like we had to know the laxation point, which is when you get diarrhea, of how much high fructose corn syrup we could put into a children's product, and they were at that point. Like, so if you take two doses a day as a child, and you eat a gummy bear or something, you're over the laxation point um, based on like making them so sweet. So that was kind of my backstory. And then with my insomnia, I needed to figure out how to solve my own problem. And I, like I said, I did so many things, and I found like certain over-the-counter supplements that worked, but it wasn't getting to the root issue of the problem. It was like, again, solving for symptoms. And I could find how to solve for them well and get to sleep, but I wasn't solving the real problem. And this is kind of a, one of the problems. For all of human history, and Suzanne talked about this yesterday, whether you believe in like creation or design, our biology, the way it works is it's synced to the cycles of the planet that we live on. So for all of human history, after dark, after the sun sets, we would have seen firelight, and we would have seen starlight, and that's it. But now, this is what we've done. Let's see if I can move out of here, but it's still gonna be fun. So we kind of turned nighttime into day. Basically, we brightened up the night so that we can see everything all the time. So if you can imagine living in New York City in the 1800s, it's 7 p.m., it's December, it gets dark at like 4.30 in the afternoon in, on the East Coast and in the Northern climates. So you probably would end sleeping. Now, some people can have firelight, like candles, etc., but those were very expensive to run in a pain, so you'd probably be sleeping. We were in New York City a couple years ago, and that's what it looks like at night. Uh, maybe not so much in the last year and a half, but it's busy, People are out and active. We basically ensure that we can continue our work long into the nighttime when we should be sleeping. And this statistic is actually low. It looks really high. 95% of our time is spent indoors. The 
The reason it's low is when I actually look at the pie chart, they, con they consider driving or commuting to work outdoor time. <laughs> Which I don't believe that that's the case because you're in your car. And I was telling some people last night, so we bought a spectrometer and that's what measures those different wavelengths, intensity, frequency of light. So we would measure the light outdoors from the sun and then the light coming in through the windows, whether it's a home or a car. There's lots of natural light here, but these windows, whether it's your car or your home, block 50% of the red and infrared light, almost all the ultraviolet, but let in 100% of the blue light. So even though you're commuting, unless your windows are rolled down or your sunroof, it's not really considered outdoor time because the light you're exposed to is very altered. In addition, in the winter, if you live in a northern climate, you might go from your home to your garage, get in your car, drive to work, maybe park in a parking garage, go to work, go to the store, go to the gym, go home. Your ultimate outdoor time might be two minutes in a given day in the winter. But if our bodies are designed for life on this planet and we are altering our environment to something that is man-made, artificial, and not designed to work with our biology, we can run into issues. And you can prove that by looking at when people go into space uh, as astronauts, they are divorced from these signals of the Earth, Schumann resonance, the mag Earth's magnetic field, the circadian cycle of the Earth, which we're going to talk about, they're seeing the sun pretty much all the time. And we've seen bone density decreases. We've seen all these issues with people when they come back from these places because they are away from these natural signals that are so important. And we can talk about what some of these natural signals are, which I mentioned. There's lots of them. We can go into great detail on those. But what we've largely done in our daily lives is we've replaced those natural signals almost like the astronauts experience in outer space. So if you think about our life on this planet now, we're wearing rubber-soled shoes, which insulate us from the Earth's signals, from being able to ground on the Earth, from being able to receive those signals through our feet, from being able to relieve inflammation or positive charge in the body through grounding. We are surrounding ourselves with microwave radiation at a time one times 10 to the 18 zeros, that's a really large number, I don't even know what that number corresponds to, but 18 zeros after it, more microwave radiation passing through our body every second than ever before in history. We've had plenty of time, you know, if you believe in evolution or design, to adhere ourselves to the microwaves, the ultraviolet light, all these things that come from the sun and the proportion that they come from. We can protect our bodies with melanin. We can protect our bodies by letting it flood with a certain amount of, of pro-oxidants or um, free radicals to signal the body to protect itself. But we've never been able to protect it from the amount of microwave radiation that's now bombarding all of our built environment. And so there's no protective mechanism in the body that's been designed to help us with that. So if this is just a visual representation of the energy coming off of somebody's Wi-Fi on their phone. So these invisible signals are everywhere and we know they affect us. Infrared light is invisible. Ultraviolet light is invisible. We know they have huge impacts on our body. All of these signals do. We can talk about you know, being divorced from the earth and how we reconnect with the earth. Being grounded, barefoot on the earth. Reducing that inflammation or positive charge. Absorbing electrons. We can talk through some of the details of that. Like what does the mitochondria in the body do? energy center of the body, right? And what we know about the mitochondria is we need energy to be alive. But the mitochondria, it doesn't use fat, carbs, or protein. That's what most people think. Like, I need energy, I'm gonna have protein, or fat, or carbs. That's not how it works. It works off of electrons. It's called the electron transport chain. So when we absorb free electrons from the ground, that's basically free energy. And we're gonna talk about the light aspect of all of this, which is the circadian biology. So we can talk about all those things at the end if you have questions, but we're gonna focus really intently today on the light and dark cycles of our planet. And our body is intimately tuned to those cycles in a process that's called the circadian rhythm, our circadian biology. So the Nobel Prize in Medicine 2017 was given to three scientists who were studying 
circadian biology and its huge impact on health. So, circadian biology or circadian rhythm is really the way that our body has adapted to the light and dark cycles of the Earth. So the Earth you know, spins on its axis, unless you're a flat earther, and then the sun spins around the Earth and it gets dark at certain times. And when it gets dark, there's certain signals that go on in the body. And when the sun rises, there's other signals that go on in the body that run our physiology. And that's called the circadian rhythm. So the thing that sets all of our circadian rhythm in our body that keeps us ultimately optimally healthy is the sun. So there's this, what you can call a light switch or a master clock in your body. Every cell of your body has a clock in it. Those clocks are designed to be set to the sun. And we receive the signal that sets the clock through light entering our eye. Now, if you're outdoors with sunglasses or glasses or contacts, you're getting an altered signal. If you're indoors under man-made light, which was ultimately designed for energy efficiency, inability to allow you to perform a specific task with enough light to do it without hurting yourself or others, it was never designed to be compatible with human biology. So when light enters the eye, it enters the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, and then it gives signals to the pituitary, the thyroid, the pineal gland, and then it sets our organ clocks, the, all the cells clocks in our body. And when there is an altered signal that enters the eye that tells the body it's the wrong time of day. So again, at dawn, there's a certain color of light that comes out in the sun. And we have receptors in our eye called melanopsin that measures the amount of blue light coming from the sun. That blue light changes throughout the day. It changes at dusk. And it is absent after the sun sets. So when you look at your phone in the morning, first thing, you're getting this huge blue light signal to those <coughs> melanopsin receptors telling your body that it is noon in the middle of the day and to really jack up your cortisol. And it's giving you a circadian mismatch between the time of day that your body is going to see the rest of the day if you get outside and what time it is inside your body. That's called a circadian mismatch. Now, what we're finding is circadian rhythms affect reproduction, metabolism heart rate, body temperature, the sleep and wake cycle, cortisol, all of these things are set by light entering your eye through different hormones that get released in the body. This is just one really good example that I pulled uh, off of a study, and it was basically saying, based on circadian rhythm, we have, so I'm not a doctor, but let's say someone who's a doctor has a patient, and they prescribe a, medi a medication. And sometimes you find like these patients have all sorts of side effects, so they're not working for them, and other patients have great success. The time of day that somebody takes a medication determines whether it does what it's supposed to do and gives you a benefit or can actually harm the patient. That's what this study was showing, and that's all based on the circadian rhythm and the different signals and hormones that are being produced at a certain time of day. So this is, I think we're at the very infancy of studying this kind of thing, I'm like, it makes a difference of when you take this, and for each person that could be different based on the light that they're exposed to during the day. What medication was that? You know, I would have to look at the study. And it looked like it's a blood pressure study. Okay, okay. I see very well. I also, again, I'm using a different laptop because I had to send my work laptop back, and on that PowerPoint, it's got all the, um, and it's actually on this share drive too. It's got all the studies listed in the notes. So this is missing the top of it. But this should say that all animals on the planet, all of them, produce melatonin. So this is the hormone of darkness, only at night. Now, melatonin is one of these things that's intimately tied to our circadian rhythm. And we're finding out every day how massively important melatonin is to our health. Massively important. Now, the interesting thing is we think about humans. So you can tell me that you're a night owl and you do your best work at night, you love staying up, but humans are diurnal animals. That means we live during the day and we sleep at night. Rats and mice are nocturnal animals. 
They have biology designed to be awake at night. So the issue is if you're awake all night and seeing the light, your melatonin may not be produced. We're gonna mm -hmm. talk about that. But the interesting thing is even nocturnal animals like mice and rats produce melatonin only at night, not during the day, which is odd. So if you don't ever see the night, if we take away the night and light up our skies like it's daytime, we never get the benefit of this. And this is what's happening to most people. There's tons of studies that the NIH is doing. And when I did my TED talk on this, I think I looked up thousands of ALAN studies, artificial light at night, A-L-A-N. And what's being shown is even 15 seconds. So there's a few studies that show um, a dim light conditions, it can be an hour. There's other studies that show um, an intense light, like looking at an iPad, for as little as 15 seconds can destroy the melatonin after sunset that your body is trying to release and produce. So when you wake up in the middle of the night and you turn your phone on to look at the time or run to the bathroom and flip on the light switch, that's what's happening. And we know that melatonin and cortisol are opposites. So if we're destroying melatonin, we're probably signaling the body to increase cortisol. And that's what I was doing every single night is increasing my cortisol, therefore my melatonin hormone was not being released by the pineal, meaning I'm not getting the signal to sleep. I'm not getting, and even if I did sleep, I'd wake up like after eight hours, if you've ever kind of woken up after eight hours and felt like you didn't really sleep that well, even though you didn't remember waking up, you feel groggy, maybe some brain fog, and that could be because your melatonin was not doing what it's supposed to do in the middle of the night, which is rejuvenation and repairing different systems of the body. It's a master uh, antioxidant for the body, and it's also been shown to repair damaged mitochondria. So in the daytime, you want cortisol. You want to be awake and alert, and the signal of blue light through the eye as the sun rises tells your body, produce cortisol, destroy melatonin. We need to be awake and alert. And this is Harvard Medical School Journal. So they have an article titled The Dark Side of Blue Light. And so they're talking about right down here. So blue light, the research is showing, can contribute to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. So lots of different things. A lot of it correlated with that uh, melatonin release at night. So here are some of the studies. Uh, Leland Stillman is a medical doctor out of Florida. His Instagram does a really good job of putting a lot of these pieces together uh, from a medical doctor point of view. And he has, I would say, quite a few videos on Instagram as well, teaching medical care professionals about melatonin and sunlight and blue light. So we met him in Mexico a few years ago. We were all studying under um, a medical doctor by the name of Dr. Jack Cruz very controversial figure. He's got a lot of podcasts out uh, on other people's podcasts. He's a neurosurgeon, did a huge deep dive into blue light, quantum physics, and all these things. He's a genius. He's also a jerk. So um, <laughs> really good information, really controversial person. Um, so we were learning from him. So Leland was another guy that learned from Dr. Cruz. Now he's got his own practice, and he's like a much nicer person. Than <laughs> I like the so we're, we're seeing like a lot of um, even cancers being associated with this artificial light exposure at night. And it is classified as a human carcinogen. I believe it's type 2B, which would be the same as asbestos, uh, benzene, smoking, and Wi-Fi. And that's why third shift workers, <coughs> especially studied nurses, easier to draw blood from nurses than other people, because you've got all the equipment there and they can sign off on it. Um, so lots of third shift workers have issues with I'm also like attention span and mood. So a lot of your sleep and your melatonin production sets the rest of your hormones throughout the rest of the day. So different neurotransmitters, dopamine and other things get destroyed by looking at these devices or artificial light at the wrong times. So again, there's lots of studies. I have quite a few of them reference and notes. This one was uh, an older book and study that was done. And this was done on a surgeon who did cataract surgery and what he found is that after removing the cataracts and people could observe the light through their eye without anything blocking it that their metabolism would change and so he did a lot of studies on metabolism back in the 70s humans and animals showing that 
metabolism is linked to light exposure, where we think calories in, calories out, more movement, less food, that, those types of things, not as important as light is what some of these studies are finding. I'm going to show you a really cool one here in a minute. So again, and this is what we're talking about, like melatonin setting the reproductive cycles and insulin sensitivity. So what happens is when you start being exposed to the wrong type of light, you become <coughs> insulin sensitive at night and insulin insensitive during the day, and that's the opposite of what is supposed to happen in your body, which is why there's tons of studies showing that people that eat food, more meals after dark, have higher rates of obesity and more weight on their body because your cells are not meant to absorb nutrition at that time of the day. And your glucose intolerance is very different. So we can look at the different forms of light. So of course, firelight and melatonin suppression is very little. There's very little blue light in firelight. Now we have found some candle lights actually have quite a lot of blue light depending on what the wax is made from. But normal like wood firelight, very low melatonin suppression. But even incandescent, so when we, we moved to incandescent, late 1800s, early 1900s, and it really took off, we start to see um, more industrial-based chronic uh, conditions and diseases occur. Part of it we think linked to light. Um, even incandescent, which is a better light um, than what we're using today often, can, can reduce your melatonin by 40%. And then you look at compact fluorescent and LED light, and it's basically just these high spikes of blue light, um, very altered spectrum from what's outdoors, <coughs> just completely destroying melatonin. And so here's a graph where they did, uh, I believe this is salivary melatonin throughout the night, and they actually have another chart like this that's really interesting where they have people wear blue light blocking glasses and they did the same study, but this is just green. So 555 nanometer is green light, basically 450 to 490 nanometer is blue light. And you can see the melatonin is beginning to peak as um, the darkness comes on. So it's the hormone of darkness. Your body has to experience darkness for a period of time before the melatonin is released from the pineal. That melatonin that is built in your body is formed from a protein that you eat that's converted to tryptophan. Then the tryptophan gets programmed by the light through your eye from sunlight into serotonin, and then the serotonin from the gut and from the brain is then converted to melatonin and released after dark. That whole cycle gets disrupted if you're not programming those aromatic amino acids by the sunlight and you're seeing artificial spectrums of light. So you see the melatonin crash from the blue light and you also see a reduction in the green. Over time, the melatonin bounces back if you're exposed to green light, but it stays suppressed the entire night with blue light. Now, those are pure wavelengths of light. If you were to show the same thing with red light, you would get no melatonin suppression with pure red light. So the frequency or the wavelength of light makes a really big difference. I was going to get to that, but do you know anything like, I know there's like the night shift mode on your yeah. phone. Does that change the spectrum of blue it light? Or, okay. So there's always blue light. Um, I'll show you some examples though. Um, there's always blue light coming out of your devices because those LEDs are based on a white mm -hmm. enhanced blue light or blue enhanced white light, depending on the drivers they're using for the LEDs. So the night shift is, is basically putting a filter over the white light coming out so that it's more yellow, orange, and red. There's better programs that you can use on my other laptop called Iris, I-R-I-S. Used to be free, I think now. Then it was $2, and now I don't know what it it's costs. Iris Tech. IrisTech.co. Yeah. Um, so IrisTech.co is now paid version, but you can get pure red, or you can do a reading version of your screen, and it's going to be just black and white, and there's going to be like, it dials out 100% of the blue light. You cannot do color work at night, so if you're a designer, it's not going to be helpful to you. Um, but you can, um, even using the free software, so Flux, yeah, F-L-U-X, Flux is free, that's what's on this laptop right now. I think Iris is a dollar or two a month. Okay. So even like changing like to dark mode. It makes a huge difference. All those things make a difference to um, reduce the blue light coming off your devices at night. So there's, I'll show you some of the things you can do um, that are kind of unique as well. But that does make a big difference. So 2016, American Medical Association warned uh, about LED streetlights. Human health problems, but also problems for like animals. 
So you have birds, you've got owls, you've got all these things that need nighttime as well as we do. Um, sea turtles at sea, like everything's kind of getting messed up with these lights that we're putting everywhere at night. Uh, but especially humans, because we measure more humans than we do animals. But the animals um, have just as big of a problem. So, you know, I know people that live on like Vancouver Island and they have lights around their home, they have big properties, but they'll use red lights and then they still get all the wildlife. And that's what hunters use at night to not destroy night vision and not scare the nocturnal animals. So a whole bunch of studies basically describing what's happening as our eye receives the melanopsin signals in the eye from the blue light. So again, it's blue frequency of light. We can only perceive two wavelengths of light through the eye and the skin that the body uses to manufacture the physiology of the body. Ultraviolet and blue. You can obviously see all the other colors from the rods and cones in the eye, but we only have receptors that don't receive signals to turn it into a, a picture, but actually drive your biology from ultraviolet, which is the neuropsin receptors, helps your body decide how much melanin to make in the skin, and then melanopsin, which perceives blue light. And we do have those receptors in the fat cells, but the majority of the signals come through the eye. And then we can see like towards the end, once you're under this artificial light more often, you start seeing more obesity. And there's a really great study that's basically showing like this melatonin, which we probably also heard for um, during the pandemic, like high, people are doing high dose melatonin um, to help with the virus. That's not something I'm gonna get into because I'm not an expert on that. Um, but as an anti-obesogen for a weight loss um, hormone, there's lots of research coming out. And this is one, one of the ones I really love. And I believe this was either 2019 or 2020. So two sets of mice, same calories in, calories out. So they received the same exact amount of exercise. This was measured. The exact same quantity, quality of food. So they ate the same food and they had the same amount of exercise. But they obviously don't look the same. The only difference between the two mice is one had lights on for 12 hours, lights off for 12 hours. The mouse on the left, the obese mouse, 24 hours a day of light. The only difference. So that could be basically telling me that it's not just the food that you eat or the exercise that you do, that light has a huge impact uh, on our biology and our physiology. So we can actually liken the wrong type of light in our environment to junk food. It's like junk lighting or fast lighting, fast food. So you can think of the same thing. There's fast fashion and there's all these things that we've done to our environment in the name of like more stuff and cheaper energy and cheaper lighting that has created this environment around us that is non-optimized for our biology and in fact harming us. So, if your environment is the problem, but you're trying to solve you know, symptoms, it's never really gonna help. So I always try to look the way that I kind of live my life and look at things is like, what's going on in the environment around me? And then what's going on in the environment inside of me? And how can I fix those two things? So we can look at you know, altered spectrums. Just first of all, I talked about this. The top two uh, graphs, is a spectromagnetic version of sunrise and sunset. Very different colors. Your body is getting different signals. That's how it tells time of day. But indoors, not only have we altered the environment to be completely artificial and alien to what our body has been designed to look at, but it never changes. You turn on the lights at 3 a.m. and you turn on the lights at 6 p.m. and it's the exact same light environment. And we continue to alter the spectrum. So you can almost look like in the 1980s, 1800s, the spectrum was at least somewhat familiar compared to the sun, and now the bottom one is an LED or a compact fluorescent. It's very altered spectrums of light qualities <clears throat> that your body does perceive. And in addition to that, we've added flicker. So with LED lights, they all have a flicker rate. And that flicker rate, you may not see it flicker, but often if you take your phone and you videotape this, you'll see the flicker your brain does perceive that and it perceives it as stress. So what do we do if we know all of these things are true? So number one, we want to set our circadian biology 
by getting outdoors first thing in the morning before you look at your phone. You can open a window and just look outside. You can go outside, which is more ideal, and stand barefoot on the ground and watch the sunrise. You'll notice that the sun rises at a different time every single morning throughout the year and in a different location. So I think that's just really cool to be tuned in. Like I know in the summer, the sun is gonna rise like over here when I'm staring outside to the east. And in the winter, it rises way over here. And it rises, you know, at 5, 15 a.m. in the summer. So I'm getting up much earlier and getting outside. And then in the winter, it's rising at like 7.45. So it's very different. And that signal, again, there's no ultraviolet in the morning sunrise. That signal setting your circadian rhythm. And I'll tell you one story um, where the infrared, so you've got 42% infrared from the sun. That's the majority of what's coming off the sun in one wavelength is infrared light. And there's studies that show infrared light can allow your body to absorb more ultraviolet later in the day. So why is that important? So you get outside, expose as much of your skin as possible, plus your eyes to the sunrise. No ultraviolet. So personally, I look directly at the sun. I've been doing that for almost 15 years. I don't wear glasses. So um, regardless of what people tell you, I do that. I don't recommend anyone else do that. You look 15 degrees off the sun, so you're not staring directly at it. Um, I stare directly at the sun, and I find benefit in that myself. The other thing you get is with that infrared. So I think the infrared rays are healing, and they're the antidote to all the blue light we get from inside. There is a study that shows absorbing more ultraviolet can be extremely beneficial, again, safely. So ultraviolet comes into the sun later in the day, specifically ultraviolet B, when the sun gets above 45 degrees from the horizon is the only time you can get ultraviolet B. That makes vitamin D in our bodies. We store vitamin D in the fat. We can look at vitamin D levels all winter long and people are super low and that's really not great for virus and disease and all sorts of things. So how do you raise it? You can take D3 supplementation, but that can be toxic in higher doses. And it only works from what I've seen in the literature up to a certain point and then it doesn't really have as much benefit. So let's say a normal pill is 400 IUs of vitamin D. So I, let's say I take 10 of those. That might be toxic because it's fat-soluble vitamin. And it's a chemical signal. Your body has never been designed to absorb hormones from your food. So vitamin D is not really a vitamin, it's a hormone. It's sulfated cholesterol that turns into a hormone in your body and it gives these signals. So we, we're not designed to eat our hormones, we're designed to produce our hormone, hormones in our body. So getting the chemical signal from the sun to, salt, to hit the sulfated cholesterol to make vitamin D in your body is the preferred way. And then it absorbs it in the fat and you can make up to 50 to 80,000 IUs of vitamin D from the sun in one session. You could never eat that much from a capsule without toxicity. Then when you store it in your fat all winter long, you're now bursting those fat cells when you either fast overnight and releasing or liberating that vitamin D into your body all winter, which is how we keep our D levels high in the winter, you've got to first absorb it in the summer to have high levels. And the way to absorb more is to be outside uh, in the dawn sun to absorb the infrared. So what we did is it's called building a solar callus. We got out every day for two months in the dawn time sun, and we've got clothing that is tan through and allows the light to come through because you can't really be naked in a suburban neighborhood um, in your front yard. And so, you know, I've got a pair of shorts and she has a swimsuit that's tan through. And we absorb this infrared and then we can be out longer during the day. So we went to Boston and New York City in 2019. We met two of her friends at noon. So we had been outside, I didn't have a shirt on, we've got photos and I think I hid the slide on here, um, where we were outside for 10 hours. And we met her friends to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge for an hour and they got so sunburned they went home after they walked across the bridge with us and they wouldn't come back out with us on Sunday because they were in so much pain. And we just kept staying out. And that solar callus allowed us to absorb the light safely where they had sunglasses on, they were insulated from the ground, and they just burnt. And we have shown and have friends, even with like an Irish complexion, building a solar callus and they can now be out in the sun for hours with no sunscreen and they don't get burnt. So again, there's a safe way to absorb as much vitamin D from the sun as possible. You obviously don't want to get sunburned and you don't want to be out in the sun to where it's you're, you're absorbing too much of those rays and damaging your skin. 
And then wear your sunglasses at night. So that's why you'll see us wearing our blue light blocking glasses indoors and at night and not outdoors during the day because we want the signal from the sun into our eyes. How much ultraviolet is in there? How do we protect our skin? What time of day is it? How do we help ourselves sleep better at night? And then at night, we don't want to destroy this melatonin that we spent all day building to repair and rejuvenate ourselves. So we wear blue light blocking glasses at night. You don't have to change anything else in the environment if you just put on a pair of glasses. And so to me, that's what solved my insomnia at night was literally just putting on a pair of blue light blocking glasses. You can even get a pair for like $2 off Amazon and try it at home. They look like safety glasses, um, but in the comfort of your home, they're totally fine for you to see if it works for you. It made a massive difference for me. And that's why I went out and gave a TED talk on it. It was a huge difference. What time do you start wearing them? Soon as the sun sets and then until the sun rises. So they sit next to my bed and then we put them on like in the morning, we'll be wearing them until the sun rises and then we want to get them off and get that blue light in our eye and signal to the body the time of day. I sometimes have the red shade because like, I know I have like blue light blocking glasses at work that are more like clear with maybe a little bit of like a blue tint almost. So those are different type of lens. Yep, there's um, lenses that can block any amount of blue. So they can go from blocking no blue light to blocking all the blue light. Okay. And the, the ones that we wear block 100% of the blue light, but you can have some that block 10 to 50% of the blue light for daytime use. I don't recommend anyone wear them during the day because you need the blue light unless you're in a room with no windows. So you're in a hospital, you're in a patient room or whatever, and there's tons of studies that show that the blue light through the eye causes free radicals and could lead to macular degeneration long term. So everyone's staring at their screens all day long in a poorly lit environment. That's where I wear blue light blocking glasses that block about 30 to 50% of the blue light. And that's what I do wear if I go back to corporate headquarters and I've got to sit in a meeting room with no windows. I'll put on a pair of blue light blocking glasses and I try to get outdoors then to, it's a, the circadian signals are a quantum so like a teeny tiny bit makes a massive difference to your body. So even if you can get outdoors for like 30 seconds and see the, the sun and the blue, that makes a really big difference. That is, can you explain the daytime glasses? Because I think that's what, it, it didn't quite oh, so, say that. So the glasses that are more clear <coughs> lenses or yellow are for daytime use because you still need some blue. If you block all the blue during the day, brain's gonna think it's nighttime and start like producing that melatonin and it's gonna mess up your clock so you want to, basically the blue light blocking glasses, the daytime glasses, block high intensity blue. And that's what's causing eye damage because we're seeing like every screen, every light has yeah. high intensity blue. The window lets in 100% of the blue, but none of the um, UV. So, so even if your office had a window, it would still be appropriate to wear those 30 to 50 when you're on your screen and stuff. Like yeah, I mean, I would, um, but I would like take them off frequently. Okay. So just so you get the full signal and then put them back on. Yeah. And we talked about eating, so um, we can't always be perfect, but in our daily life, like generally, we stop eating before it gets dark. And that means in the winter, like we're eating dinner at four o'clock in the afternoon. And actually, it makes really good sense because most of us biologically would have been fasting more in the winter anyway, cleaning up all that junk in the summer and reversing, like, honestly, there's some really compelling research out there that says we're supposed to kind of be insulin insensitive and almost create diabetes during the summer and put on weight and then in the winter you're going to reverse all that but we never turn off the lights and stop eating carbs we just keep doing all that so we never reverse it so in the winter appropriately we will stop eating around 4 or 30 and we won't eat again until maybe 9 or 10 the next day so we're intermittent fasting for 18 20 hours and we're basically um, using the fat in our bodies as energy and we're reversing all that stuff that we would have eaten all through the fall. I like to eat about 18 pumpkin pies between now and Thanksgiving, so. <laughs> he actually eats nine, nine pumpkin, pumpkin pies. pies. Seven <laughs> last year, so, yeah, that's true. so yeah, I eat a lot of carbs in the fall and that's when that stuff would be plentifully available and then we begin a like ketogenic type diet around winter solstice. Um, but we do try to stop eating. So in the summer, yeah, you just you eat what's available and there's lots of carbs available and there's lots of fruit and you can eat till almost all hours of the day, all the way until nine or 10 o'clock at night from where you live. And then your body gets the signal that it's dark and you really wanna stop eating, if at all possible. Again, not always possible. There's a lecture going on, we're gonna eat a little bit later tonight. You know, you do your best. 
color temperature. So you can see it gets bluer as the temperature gets uh, colder, but higher degrees. It's kind of hot. So we would say this like a colder light, and then at the other end of the spectrum, it's a warmer light, even though the color temperature is less. So when you, if you're going to choose an LED light, you want to choose a warmer LED light that has less blue light in it. Also, it just looks cozier than like sterile blue light that you'd have to have in a hospital to be able to see what you're doing. So uh, down at that thousand Kelvin or lower is where you want to be at night. During the day, it's fine to use higher intensity lights. Your phone. So. On our phone, I think we've got night shift. Everyone has like an iPhone or an Android. They all have night mode or night shift. And that's kind of what the middle one looks like from the normal blue light. But you can also go into your color settings. And after a certain time of night, you can shift it to pure red. So it's not going to give you the signal uh, of bright blue light. Is that Apple phone only? That's only on Apple. You can't do it on an Android that I'm aware of. And there's a YouTube video. It's not mine, but you can see this is a YouTube video that shows you exactly how. This is Dr. Peter Atia. It's one of his presentations. He's a medical doctor. He does a lot of um, anti-aging medicine and anti-obesity stuff. And so he works a lot with like metformin and all this other stuff. So he, he has like his entire house designed for circadian rhythm where the light, the slide before this is his lights actually change from bright blue to red uh, throughout the day. What's his name again? Peter Atia. Like on a timer? It's almost like a light. Yeah, you can get, I think Philips Hue um, has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth-based lights that change, and you can program them on what time of day you want them to be, what color temperature. They're getting really good at figuring out what they have to do, but no one's really had a, made a good solution yet of lights that work on a circadian cycle. Everyone's, not everyone, a lot of people are looking at it now from Philips to others, so I think we're going to see them in the next few years, circadian lights. But you wouldn't recommend the Bluetooth light bulb. I don't recommend Wi-Fi or Bluetooth light bulbs. That's why I don't like Philips Hue. Um, but it's like how you program them without that. So I'm light, like, sure. light a candle. All <laughs> yeah, right. Honestly, like um, what most people don't know. So I work for um, the world's largest furniture company, and we make a lot of lighting. And we don't make the bulbs, but we have to check that the bulbs. Um, so the FCC, Federal Communication Commission, like, determines five people, not one of them is a medical doctor, not one of them is a research scientist, they're ex-attorneys from the wireless industry, but they determine safety of wireless devices. And any LED bulb, any one of them, doesn't matter if it's connected to the Wi-Fi or not, like grab one off the shelf at you know, Walmart and plug it in, it emits microwave radiation. And so they have to be certified to the FCC that it won't impair like pacemakers and other things that also work off microwave radiation. So all LEDs are emitting microwave radiation, whether they have Bluetooth or not, embedded in them. Mm. Which is odd. I never knew that until I started getting these reports and having to work on it. So at night, this is off Amazon. I think it's like $5 off Amazon. You can buy like a red night light. So if you don't want to turn on the lights in your bathroom, but you have kids or yourself getting up in the middle of the night, you don't want to destroy your melatonin, you can put these in the hallway. Our hallway is lit up with red lights. Um, we don't have any lights in our bathrooms. Upstairs, downstairs, we have red. What about like an amber, like um, salt lamp? That's where we started. So I start out with salt lamps. That can be really good. We still have a, some blue light, but it, because it's filtered through that red, orange um, rock, way better. So I started out with that in my kids' rooms when they were babies, and that was great. And then I ended up like pulling the bulb out and putting a red bulb inside the salt lamp. Um, it's You can't see color really well with red, so if you're cooking, like, honestly, like, this is part of um, the Minneapolis Star Tribune did a big four-page article on us in our house last year, um, took photos. This is one of their photos. So this is our bedroom. Like, that's Faraday Cage, the block, electromagnetic frequency at night. So we're completely protected from any, any uh, EMF. Um, and then we have red lights. So if you were to cook with red light, everything looks great. So the only place in our home where we have, like, Regular lighting is we've got a strip of lights in our kitchen with a halogen light on the stove so we can make sure we're cooking appropriately. And, like, you know, if you want to fully cook your meat too, and you gotta know if you can't see <laughs> blood in red. If somebody cuts themselves, you won't see blood in red light. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, so we do have like two red lights in the kitchen and two regular lights. There's a bathroom light too. We can turn on a bathroom light if you need to make up or see something, yeah. but um, the normal light that's always on in the bathroom. 
So. It's it's um, silver textile, and so I have YouTube videos showing with a microwave meter. So you've got cell phone towers and the neighbor's Wi-Fi. We don't have Wi-Fi at our house. Everything's hard connected to a landline. Um, but I don't want to be impacted by these signals when I sleep, and it, that can actually impact your melatonin. These uh, signals from cell phones. So inside the cage, you, there is zero microwave radiation. I cannot measure any with a really sensitive. So that is basically like a little Faraday cage or a protective environment to sleep in and allow us to get like a, make a primal sleeping environment. So the company that we own is called Primal Hacker. So Primal Hacker, I can show you where we are on the web or whatever, but um, we don't make those cages. We just like experiment, measure, and talk about that kind of stuff. We'll have Jamie link that to the QR code or website. Yeah, yeah if we want to. Oh, okay. Oh, perfect. If you're looking, so a red light that I use, there's a lot of things that I use that's happened over the years because I'm a terrible sleeper, a terrible night owl, but I, so I have a red light by my nightstand now, and that's all I use at night time. But I have the sauna space red light, and mm -hmm. it's just one that you can try while you're here to see if you like it, because in the sauna, mm -hmm. it's also where Kayla, um, and there's a single standing light where Kayla's doing the massages. And I like it because it's red light, but it also gives off warmth, so in the winter it feels really good. It's like my mm -hmm. happy place. So if you want to try it, we have them here. That's my point. It's, it's an interesting, you know, um, single light that you can just put on your nightstand or wherever and use it. And we've measured that that light um, with the spectrometer. So that's like well, it's the same. This one has four of them, so it's you know gets much more warm or more warm than say the single light that Kayla has in the massage room. Yeah, they're made to get you to sweat. There's infrared light, red light. And then far infrared, which is like mid to far infrared, is more heating light. So all of that is in that little song. If someone didn't have an awesome silver cape, would it even just putting your cell phone out of your bedroom? Like, is that enough yes. to block any of those waves? Like if it's in a different room? And maybe you have that coming up, then you can see. I, I don't have it coming up. I've got a YouTube video where I take my microwave meter and show you how far away you need to be from certain things. No. So number one, like the microwave in your house. I mean, honestly, like there's over 5,500 peer-reviewed published studies on microwave radiation and how it impacts human biology. So regardless of what FCC tells you that it's safe, they're lawyers, they're not scientists. <laughs> like the scientists have already done the research. The EPA did the research and the FCC made them shut down the research at EPA. So 5,500 peer-reviewed published articles are out there. You can find them all on one website called bioinitiative.org. And they highlight them by the effect. Turn it like your microwave oven is sealed, right? So the microwaves don't come out. You never want to put your head in there. So open your microwave oven up one time and look at the door. It tells you the frequency of the microwaves that come out of it. 2.45 gigahertz. You can see it. It says it on this little sticker. It has to by law. Then look at the back of your Wi-Fi router. It's the same sticker. It's the same frequency. 2.45 gigahertz. So if that Wi-Fi router is under your desk at work or under your bed at night, you're microwaving yourself with the same frequency that the microwave cooks food at 24 hours a day. So it's drying out your cells, and it's doing a lot of other things in between that are shown in some of those 5,500 published articles. And the further away you are, the better. So time, distance, and then active blocking technologies are how you minimize risk. It's a inverse square law, which means if you're an inch away, the intensity that's hitting your body drops by 100 times or 10 times. So every inch is like 10 times a drop in the intensity. But we turn, like I can, I wish I brought my meter with me, but if I turn that microwave on, my meter will read red as dangerous right here. Not one of those microwaves is ever sealed. They say they are, and I'll show you, I mean, I've got a YouTube video here and an Instagram video, and you can watch me show you the, the meter, turn on the microwave, and it spikes to red, and it makes all this crazy noise, and I walk out the front door, as further away from this microwave than I am now, and it's still going crazy. So your cell phone is way less intense than that microwave, so you can, like, again, you're on call, you're a medical doctor, you don't have a landline, so you just put your phone outside your bedroom door. It make, That makes a huge difference just by that little bit of distance. Yeah. So like kids that sleep with their phone under their pillow, like that. 
You mean doctors aren't called to see the difference? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any devices you could put it in next yeah. year? We yeah. have we have um, Faraday cages that we put our phones in. So like, yeah. I, Google and others have patents. And I'll show you the patents if you want to see them. They're out there. They're public. I don't know what they have that are not public. Um, where they can manipulate your emotions and your mind through the signals from a cell phone. Um, I don't want any of those signals that are embedded in an app doing anything to me at night, so I put it in a Faraday cage. Even though it's on airplane mode, so mine's on airplane mode, it's in a Faraday cage, if you have to have it on. There's a product from HaraPad, H-A-R-A-P-A-D, HaraPad. I get a discount with them, so if you want to use my discount, it's totally fine. It's on our website. We sell them on our website, and I can give you a discount to those too if you want. Um, they're based out of Michigan. It's a guy and his mom. <laughs> so and they make a sleep, cell phone sleep shield for people just like doctors that have to be on call. And it looks like an L. looks like a laptop, except it's small. And you put your phone here, and you sleep over here, and it blocks the signal. Now, the signal's still going to leak around here, but it's going to be way less intense by using that cell phone sleep shield. They're, I think they're like $39 or something. So that's what we recommend if you have to have it on and it has to be near you. Far away from you as you can while still being on, and then you put a little shielding. This is actually from Harapad. So this is, a, this is one of their shielding technologies. And if I'm going to put my laptop on my lap where my reproductive organs are, think about young women or men, and this is where the laptop or the iPad goes, um, this blocks all the microwave. You still get a little bit leaking, but if you have to use it on your lap on Wi-Fi. Um, Do you want to pass that around? This kind of stuff is really helpful. And then David had a question. Yep. I was just going to add, I grew up, uh, one of our neighbors who worked on the team at Raytheon and invented the microwave oven. Hmm. And I stayed with him about five years ago. I remember as a kid, my mom saying, we're not going to get a microwave oven because John said, don't get it. Oh one. my god. So we worked on the team to invent it, and I stayed with him five years ago. He's never had one. And that's and that they say like truly if it was sealed and it didn't leak, that's fine. But every microwave I've ever measured, and if you're standing in front of that thing watching your food, I mean it is intense in front of there. I'll show you a video on how intense it can be on just these meters um, that are used to measure like this kind of microwave radiation. But again, it's the same exact frequency. That is lower intensity. What's inside that? Is it? Mo There's two things inside it, um, because you're trying to block the electrical um, signals and the microwave signals. So it's got two or three sandwich layers of different materials. One's called um, mu, mu metal. Mu metal. Mu metal. Okay. And, and mu metal is like the only thing I think that'll block uh, magnetic field as well. Oh right. Really hard. Other than lead. Um, it's hard to block magnetic fields. And honestly, like people that learn this stuff, they're like buying old barn wood that's painted with lead paint and putting it back up in their homes to block some of these signals. Uh, I think there's better ways to do it than that. <laughs> What's that called? Mu metal? Or yeah. the, the board. Oh, Hara pad. It, oh, says, right. it says it on here. It's just kind of hard to read. Oh, yeah. Right okay. this point. So I, I met these guys. What's that? Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. Like we haven't had a microwave. I didn't. I don't think I've ever had one since I left home, and that was like in 1994. I haven't had one since then. And you just find other ways to heat up food. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like you don't even want to put your food in there, though. <laughs> I think it just denatures the food. But um, <laughs> if you don't believe that, like it's definitely microwaving you at the same time as the food. <laughs> And 5,500 peer-reviewed studies, like, it's legit. The EPA is like, we need to regulate this, and we need to study it more. And the FCC told them, you must cease and desist. They sent them a cease and desist order. Mm -hmm. And that's why the EPA is not studying it, and that's why there is zero funding at our university level to do any microwave research. Zero. It's all being done in Israel, Turkey, Russia. Those are the only studies you can get anymore. The main two people that used to study this are... Dr. Andrew Marino, medical doctor, PhD, and an attorney, and um, Dr. Robert O'Becker, Syracuse University. They studied these things, and they started studying them in the 70s um, with the huge electric power lines that would go over people's homes and the people were having problems. So they studied that, and then they started studying microwave radiation, and what they found on all these impacts. So then the industry was like, we're gonna do our own studies, and they knew the scientists doing the studies. This is in Dr. Andrew Marino's book called Going Somewhere. And the scientists did these studies, and they kept finding the same thing. Like, 
the animals were stressed and they were having carcinogenic things bubble up in these lab animals. But, so what they did is they kept throwing away the studies. And then what they found is that they took a control animal and the microwaved animal and they kept reducing the size of the cage so the control animal was stressed all the time. Then there was no difference between the microwaved animal and the control animal. And those are the studies they've been publishing for decades. Um, and he shows you the studies that, that prove the ones they threw away and how they changed the cage to make the animal stressed to make it look like the control and the microwave mm -hmm. animal had no, no significant difference. So it's the same like to like power line, but like radio towers and like those? Radio yeah. towers, yeah. My, so like um, UHF, radio, television, all those have an effect, but they're long wavelengths. Oh, okay. So we talk about millimeter waves, that's 5G. And millimeter waves have been used by the military for crowd control and other things. And um, back in Russia, they were microwaving the U.S. Embassy and trying to harm those people with low, low intense um, microwaves in the millimeter wavelength. And then, and that's proven. You can look up that study. And they're they were just doing it now in Cuba. So you, that was like last year. Right. They're like they're microwaving these people in Cuba. <laughs> Around us, we're already doing it to ourselves, but the <laughs> Russians knew this. So you don't get, get a, a microwave really in Russia um, like you can in the US because they have studied this way more intensely than we have, and they think like these microwaves are no bueno. So we allow the amount of radiation off a cell phone tower, we allow 1,000 to 10,000 times more energy to come off of those than even China does. Mm -hmm. We're the only country in the world, other than Canada and the UK, that allow ourselves to be microwaved as much as we. China, France, Canada, Russia, they all have done away with this stuff and dialed down the intensities and removed it from their schools, um, but we do the opposite. So we can, there's like graphs that kind of show you the intensity we allow by law, and whatever intensity we allow by law, it's 10 times more than that when you measure it. It's bizarre. I think in Poland too, didn't they do that in the hospitals? Didn't Not they? Really, in certain hospitals, some nurses were telling me I haven't heard this a lot, but some nurses were saying when we take people's blood pressure in the hallway, it's always higher. But when we go into this patient room where we know the Wi-Fi doesn't reach, it's lower. And they're like, we think it's the Wi-Fi that's like increasing blood pressure. So again, there's like all these things that can increase it. I'm not sure that, that I've seen any studies on it, but I've heard some nurses kind of make that statement. So again, like back to the circadian biology, like this is what we're wearing at night. Um, from all the research, it's the one thing that I literally, like I have four of them in my backpack. I have four of them in my car, four of them in her car. Like they make so much of a difference to me and my sleep and I love my sleep that I don't leave home without them. And I encourage everyone to just give it a try for two weeks. Like get up in the morning and see the sunrise, get a $2 pair of blue light blocking glasses off Amazon Try them out at home for two weeks when you're watching TV or whatever it is, and just see how you feel after two weeks. And it, again, for me, it's been over 10 years, and I, I don't think I've missed one day in 10 years of wearing blue light blocking glasses, mm -hmm. to the point where like, we make our own now, we have our own made, because um, I wanted a specific style, and I wanted to make sure they blocked all the blue light, and so I always have a lot, because we buy them, and we get big boxes, so I just throw them in all the <laughs> kids' rooms and in our cars, um, so that makes it really Tell them about the teenagers not being able to sleep, or being able to go to bed early. Well, so, you know, we changed our house. I don't think I have any more photos of where our house looks like. Um, I might have Instagram, but we, um, because our house is red light, and we don't have any blue sources of light, really, at the house. And so the teenagers, like, they were trying on the blue light blocking glasses and seeing this red light. He couldn't stay up past 10 o'clock at night. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, so my like, son has you glasses. Wear, like, even when you have all the red yeah. lights in your house, you still wear them. Yeah, because I'll be on my laptop once oh, in a while, yeah, yeah. or yeah. I'll turn my phone on and check something. Mm -hmm. yep. So they have clip-on ones, too. So, like, my son has a really thick prescription. So he puts his little clip-on. He, he's 17, and I'm like, what time are you going to bed tonight? Oh, 10 o'clock. Like, he doesn't stay up late. Yeah, they're they're pretty synced to the lighting and, and how we live, right? And we've set that example about, like, getting up early in the morning, too. So now he gets up, and he's up by 7. For sure. So then he goes outside with those glasses on? Yep. I, contract, mm -hmm. so I, I, like, I, didn't, I knew like something was probably being blocked. Yep. But I wasn't like, I should go outside and put my contacts because I can't see. A hundred percent. Yeah. Can you talk a little more about that contact lens thing? Because I wear contacts. Yeah. Thaddeus, can you address that?